You are uniquely qualified by the way that you're connected to the people who surround you to preach the gospel to people in a way that I'm not connected with them as. There are some people that because I'm a pastor will never listen to me. In other words, what they have, a preconception in their mind about religious people, that's how they view me. I'm not a religious people, but that's how they view me. Uh, if you grew up in Catholicism, you saw abuses most likely in, by religious people. You saw things happen that turned you off. And when you hear the word pastor, the Catholic Church, uh, somebody check that uh, door. There's somebody trying to go on the other in the wrong door. Uh, there, there is uh, experiences that people have had from religious people, and anyone who has any kind of a name which would be connected religiously, anyone who has that name, just has a stigma and they're not going to be able to reach them. The people that you're connected with think the most like you. In other words, the engineers, they're all nerds. They all yeah, they share the same jokes, right? They, they enjoy the same things. And an engineer can reach an engineer. Uh, a Marine can get a hearing with a Marine that other people can't. Millennials. <laughs> <laughs> can connect with millennials. In other words, the people that you are associated with are the people who are you are most easily able to reach or most able to reach. Don't ever forget that. Sometimes people will say something to me like, I need you to visit this person for me and give them the gospel. Well, the question I have first of all is, so how have they responded to the gospel that you've shared with them? Many times people say to me, Something to the effect of, oh, well, I haven't been able to share the gospel. Come on in, we're in uh, Acts chapter 17. Sometimes they'll say something to me like, well, I haven't had the opportunity. It hasn't, it hasn't arisen, it hasn't worked out for me to do that. And the truth is that you're a soul winner. You're a soul winner if you're saved, and if you're saved, you're called. And God wants you to reach the people that are around you. And I cannot do it. And let me just share something else with you. Oftentimes, by the time it comes down to me doing your job, it's too late. Sometimes I get the call to last week. This person I'm related to is on their deathbed. And somebody needs to share the gospel with them. Well, friend, if you've known them your whole life and you haven't shared the gospel with them, their blood's not on my hands. You understand what I'm saying? In other words... I want, to, I want to lay on you as much as I can the burden that Christ gave you, which He said His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Well, see, Pastor, you're putting too big of a load on me expecting me to win my lost family and friends. No, 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 no. Let's tell Jesus that one. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you met Jesus, you had a burden on you which you could only carry to hell. Does that make sense? What was the burden that you had when you came to the cross? Sin. It was your sin. And Jesus took that on Him. And my friend, that was too heavy a burden. You couldn't handle that. Jesus took that burden on Him. And then He put His burden on you. And His burden is tell people where this is. Tell people about this cross. Tell them how to get here. Now friend, that's not too heavy a burden. It is astonishing to me that Jesus took every bit of a sin for the entirety of an individual's life, and then individuals think that it's too much to tell people about that. Mm. Does that make sense to you? So I want to just start. That's one of the things I want us to get, one of the things to <clears throat> nail down as we do our kind of sequel to our soul winning saturation, is that it's your responsibility to be a soul winner, and so you need to you need to first put a lot of thought in it and to get good at it. Now when we did our series on Saturdays, when we finished a couple people came to me and they said, okay, I like the way that you presented everything so simply, but the question I have is, how do I reach particular people? And the way it was phrased to me by four or five different people was, what if my relative or what if my co-worker is, for instance, Catholic? How do I reach a Catholic? What if my coworker is Muslim? How do I reach a Muslim? What if, and they give scenarios, and I could summarize all of that. Uh-oh. Let's, oh man. <laughs> I 
think the battery may be dead in this. Oh wait, let's try this. Folks, I'm so sorry about our technology today. <laughs> I, oh, well, wait, that's, here we go. <laughs> let's try this. I got a noise. <gasps> here we go. Okay, it's working. <clears throat> All right. The, this part of the technology is my fault. I have to know how to use some of the things. I killed that screen. I don't know what I did, but it's too late to mess with it now. Okay, so the question, how do I reach my religious friends? Now, let me just be that annoying person that goes on vacation and wants to show you all their photographs. This is a picture of a plaque, the inscription of Acts 17 on Mars Hill. I was there a week ago at uh, Mars Hill where the Apostle Paul shared the gospel. Uh, there's a button on here that makes that do that. There we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really out of sorts and it doesn't get better, it gets worse. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so I was on Mars Hill and uh, this is actually a Greek inscription of the speech, the about two minute speech that Paul gave to the philosophers in Athens on Mars Hill you know, when they wanted to hear from him. And they'd call him up there to hear them. Now, there's a lot in the, in the speech, but one of the things that Paul gave a good example of, and one of the things that we see in Acts chapter 17 is a really good example of how to connect with people, how to understand what people are thinking, while not necessarily agreeing with what they're thinking, but how to understand where they're at, and subsequently uh, get to a place where you can communicate the truth that they need to hear. And that's what Paul did on Mars Hill in Athens. Now before we read it, should we read it in Greek here? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Tafir, I can't, I can't read it very well. Um, anyway, but it's, it's, the, the, it's the inscription of the speech that he gave. Let me give you a little background uh, about the philosophy of the day. In the day, in Greek culture, and the Romans assimilated almost everything that the Greeks had. The Greek Empire, when it was conquered by Rome, was one of the few empires that Rome really almost changed nothing of. The Greeks are very, very proud of the fact that the Romans thought so much of their education and their culture and their idolatry that they didn't destroy anything. Normally, when a country conquered another nation, they would go in and tear their temple down or take out their god out of the temple and put their, replace it with their own gods. But when the Romans took over the Greek Empire, they just, they just assembled. They said, well, your gods are wonderful. We love your gods. And so they just made them Roman gods. And so, you know, the, they, they, they kept all the Greek gods, all the mythology. If you go around Athens even today, be right in the middle of a, you know, a, a metropolis, and then all of a sudden, here's this marble temple to God. I mean, I don't even know how many there are. In Paul's day, there would have been at least hundreds, perhaps thousands, of impressive structures. Anywhere you went around Athens, there are these structures with idols in them. And so Paul had arrived at Athens. He had gone there. He was waiting for, was it uh, Timothy and Titus? Uh, I believe it was Timothy and Titus. We could, we could look at the beginning of the chapter and see it. But Paul is waiting for them. And while he's in Athens, he's sharing the gospel, of course. And they called him up to Mars Hill to hear what the babbler would say. Mars Hill was a place in the Greek culture. Greeks are very proud of oratory, the fact that they speak. And every person who spoke would would have the opportunity to have the bima, which is, bima means step. So literally the bima, we think of the bima like a big judgment thing because we use the idea of, of judgment. But the Greek culture, because they were dem democratic, they didn't have like a throne kind of a situation. All they did for one person to speak to everybody was this. It was just a step. And so it was an opportunity that anybody could step on. Now, they had to schedule it because, you know, there, there would have been thousands of people, and if you let everybody speak, uh, there wouldn't be enough time. And not only that, if any, just anyone were going to speak, a lot of people wouldn't listen. How did you get someone to listen when anyone could speak? 
What's that? You gotta have something like intriguing or interesting to say. You, first of all, you have to have some content. Yeah. And number two, you have to be able to speak quickly enough. So they, they limited it to six minutes. So if you got to speak, you had to speak in six minutes. So Paul is called up for an extemporaneous opportunity to speak to the philosophers at Athens. And he has six minutes, but he only got about two before they interrupted him. So he, I want you just to keep this in mind, that when Paul preached the gospel to the philosophers at Athens, he preached the gospel in two minutes. Now think on that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, it's been proven already and tested that you lose your audience after the first 15 minutes of a speech. You, you know, it, audience is mature. It depends on the audience, but that's exactly right. Depending on the age of an audience, attention span is something you have to take in mind. I didn't even gain the audience here for some of you this morning. Some of y'all are just like, <laughs> right away. So, you know, I, I don't even know. Uh, but the, 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 that's true. And it depends. You know, it depends on the maturity and the interest. Uh, and the, inter the, the ability to interact and to speak. But the fact is is that you don't have much time, and Paul only had about, about two minutes to speak. And he had already been in Athens. He had already been going around and, and uh, seeing the city. And one of the things he saw there is the same thing that's still there today. Idols everywhere. Idols everywhere. Let's see what happens now. Oh, yes, here we go. This is Mars Hill. This is, this is where the plaque's at. And there's Melissa. As you can see, and then up in that, uh, up there, of course, is the temple. This, uh, let me see if the, yes, oh, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work on the screen. I was going to point out that right here, uh, this is, of course, the picture everybody knows of, you know, the Acropolis and so forth, and this would have been the temple right up there that the, that when Rome, uh, when Roman Catholicism conquered, uh, when it conquered Rome, that it became a Roman Catholic Church, and then the Muslims conquered it, and it became a mosque. And then, when they gained the Turks, or when the Turks conquered it, it became a mosque. And then, now today, it's becoming again. They're rebuilding. They're rebuilding it as a uh, as a temple to I, which which god is it? It's uh, Diana, I guess. You know their their favorite god. And so the Romans made it Mary. Roman Catholicism made it Mary. And and so on and so forth. Anyway, this is Mars Hill. This is the place, this is the rock where the public all came to speak. It's a little rough. I'm not sure how it would have been laid out, but it's the very location where Paul was speaking to the people in Acts. Okay, now this is small print, but you can go to Acts chapter 17 and look at verse 17. Good morning, guys. Come on in. Uh, and I'll just read it with you. Let's read along and let's hear Paul's speech. Uh, therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the... Oh, I'm sorry, verse, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So who did Paul speak to initially? He spoke initially... Come on in and sit down wherever you like. I don't think there's anyone in the nursery this morning. So you can make use of it, but... Just come make, make yourselves comfortable. You guys are fine. Uh, or you can use the nursery if you like as well. <laughs> Not for you, Eric. Uh, all right. So, Paul, the first thing he did when he went to the city is he went around and he talked to the people. Who would be the first people he talked to? Well, the Jews. Okay. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Now, the word babbler is like one, a person that blows bubbles. Or it's like a bird that, bit, 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 you know, hear a bird just chirping and just babbling. Well, that's what they called him. He said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, one of the things that, Je that Paul preached about Jesus that was different than any of the other gods. See, in, in the Greek culture, Roman culture, it'd be just fine to preach Jesus. Yes, we're open to that. We need another God. You know, if there's one we're unaware of, we want to have, we want to assimilate that God. But the difference was that Jesus was Lord. And in that day, only Caesar was Lord. And so the Jesus that Paul preached was one that kind of got their attention. They say, speaking of strange gods. Okay, so this is chapter 17 of Acts. And verse 20, it says, For thou, they said, no, verse 19. 
they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now let me stop here and off the record, Charlie. Uh, off the record, say, saying that leaving a legacy and building something physically is what it's all about. But friend, if you don't produce anything with your life, if nothing is produced by it, I ought to say something, I ought to reveal something. And Luke's commentary on this encounter that Paul had with the Athenians was that all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They talked about stuff. And they listened to people talking about stuff. Is that, is that as ironic to you as it is to me? Okay, so now they want to hear about Paul's religion. And think of the tone in which they're hearing. Well, Paul has an opportunity. He said, uh, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, that was right where Melissa was standing, and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now, I've heard this, this inscription to the unknown God either represents a God that they had lost some information about, or that he is an, uh, it is that they were so careful to worship every God that in case they missed a God, they made an altar to the one that they had not yet identified. Uh, but Paul is not here saying... Notice, as we read the text, Paul is not saying God is the unknown God. But what he's saying is you are so careful to know who God is and to worship a God that you have an inscription for an unknown God. And so he goes on to say, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. He said, I'm going to tell you who the unknown God to you is. Uh, God that made the world and all things therein. Notice this word coming up. Seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelt not in temples made with hands. As He went around the city, He observed temple here, temple there, God here, God there, a temple, a temple, a temple, a temple, a temple. And I'm telling you, it's the same thing I observed today. You'd be driving down, and all of a sudden there's this marble edifice, a couple thousand years old, and it's a temple. And Paul said, you're, you're trying to make temples. You're trying to have a temple for every single God. And he said, but the God, the Lord of the heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands. You missed it. And here he's being as terse and as uh, direct as he possibly can to tell them they're off base. He said, you're too superstitious. Now let me ask you a question. Is that a, a winning statement? Is Paul trying to win their favor? I've had people say, you know, Paul is relating to the Athenian culture and he is showing them that the gods they worship are actually real gods. Let's read through this and we'll address that point. Uh, he said, Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So God's a source of everything. He's not a limited God. Uh, he doesn't need you to worship Him. Many gods, all the Greek mythological gods, need men to worship them or they cease to exist as a god. And so they will punish men if men don't worship them. So men in turn worship them so that they don't get punished. And it's sort of like, I feed you, you feed me. You know, you, you worship me and keep me alive, existing as a god. And uh, I'll, I won't destroy you if I, whether I'm the god of the sea or the God of light or whatever it is by affecting something that will hurt you. Okay? So this is God. He's not worshipped with men's hands. Verse 26, He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord. If haply they might feel after Him and find Him though He be not far from every one of us. And so He's just given a description of a God who's different than all the gods. He's not like your gods. Every one of these statements is an attack at a particular deity. Uh, and then in verse 28, uh, Paul cites a philosopher. For in him we live and move and have our being, 
as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And so this is their, we'll look at the name of the poet and so forth. One of their ancient poets that they held in high esteem had made this statement, in him we live and move and have our being, and uh, for all his offspring. Speaking of a God, now here let me say this, Paul was taking a quote and putting it into a whole different context. The closest thing to it that you may be able to understand today is when someone will take a phrase out of the Bible and preach a sermon on it and it has nothing to do with the context that it's in. And so Paul takes this quote of this author out of context. Now, why is it he does that? Why would Paul take a quote of a Greek poet and quote it, misquote it out of context, put it in the context of God when he's talking about a deity in a whole different context? Because they could identify with it. Because they knew Paul knew. In other words, he's showing, I know, I know, understand where you're coming from. In other words, he's identifying with them, understanding where they're coming from. Listen, my friend, you will be very ineffective in preaching the gospel if people think you're from another planet. Isn't it true? You know, if people think that, you, listen, don't try to sell this, I'm a great Christian thing, when you preach the gospel to people. People can't relate to a great Christian. If they believe you, they believe you when you lie to them about being a great Christian. Or when you tr try to trick them into thinking you're really something. The only thing that will result from that is they'll think I could never do that. What am I? I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Just like everybody. Just like you. The only difference between me and you is that I'm covered with the righteous blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying me and you as a group. But I'm not better than you. I'm not different than you. Paul grew up. He was Saul of Tarsus, if you'll remember. And Tarsus was the other center of learning. It would have been the equivalent of the Athenian, uh, uh, of the city of Athens, where people learn philosophy. And so Saul would have known everything these people are thinking. And so he's quoting one of their poets so that they won't think, well, you know, he's an Israelite. He's a guy from Jerusalem. You, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, Paul is saying, I know where you're coming from. I understand where you're coming from. Somebody says to you, how could God save someone as wicked as me? Say, well, because God saves someone just as, as wicked as me and I'm just as wicked as you are. It's a, it's a connection point. Okay, so in verse 29, he said, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, or stone graven by art and man's device. Now, the... Athenians or the Greeks thought that if they built an edifice which represented their God, that the spirit of that God, if, it's, if they built a good enough edifice and they worshipped it enough, would come and live in that edifice. And what Paul is here saying is that God doesn't go live in an edifice. He doesn't live in a temple made with hands. He's not crafted or engraved out of gold or silver or stone. And... And then in verse 29, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And just in that amount of time, Paul lets people know, and you've got to do something with this information. You're accountable for this information that I've given to you. Uh, the time, uh, Verse 30, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now Dionysius the Areopagite would have been one of the philosophers of the day. And he became a believer. Now some people have said, Well, you know, Paul had no success with preaching the gospel to the Athenians. Well, actually, the truth of the matter is that Paul had great success preaching the gospel to the Athenians. They heard the truth, and he gave them the response, which is that now you have to repent. You have to believe in the resurrection. Some of them said, ha, 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 resurrection from the dead. And other people said, well, I want to hear more about this. And other people believe. That's what always happens when you preach the gospel. That's what always happens when you preach the gospel. Some people mock. Uh, and some people say, well, you know what, I'm going to think about it, and some people receive it. Okay? So keep that in mind as you preach the gospel. Uh, this is a blurry picture for your edifice or for your entertainment. We're talking about how to preach 
the gospel to people, to religious people. You know, it's one of the concerns. If someone's religious, many times people hold to the notion that if I have a belief system or if I have a religion, then, that, then God's going to judge me on the basis of how sincerely I followed my particular religion, right? You ever met somebody say, well, you know, what, how could God judge someone who is sincere, even if sincerely wrong, if they really believe that's the way to worship Him and they worshiped Him that way, then would God really send them to hell? Well, you know what? That's what religious people are banking on. They're banking on if they can convince God that they're sincere enough, then the truth of what they follow isn't really important. Why is it that religious people oftentimes are closed-minded? Sometimes you try to talk to somebody that's religious, don't want to hear it. I know what I believe. I have my faith. I have my religion. You have yours. I'm not going to judge you. You don't judge me. And I don't want to talk to you about it. Why do people... Now, that's closed-minded, isn't it? Sure. If what you believe is truth then you can't be shaken in it. I'll hear anybody's religion. Now, I don't go out exploring, oh, let me find a new religion. I'm open to believing something new. No, I have the Holy Spirit of God living in me. I know that what I believe is true. You want to tell me about what you believe, I'm happy to hear it. But the reason I want to hear it is because I want to know what you're thinking. I believe it was Francis Schaeffer, one of the apologists of, the, of this uh, last century, I believe it was Francis Schaeffer. could be a wrong quote, but it's a loose misquote anyway. But he was asked the question, if you had an hour to share the gospel with somebody, how would you spend the hour? He said, I would spend the first 55 minutes listening to what they believed, and then I would spend five minutes showing them the truth because now I have a perspective of where they're coming from. So Paul had spent time traveling around Athens. He'd grown up in, in Tarsus. He had the philosophy of the day. So he knew what they were thinking. And in his message to them, he shared with them what they were thinking. Now this picture, uh, it's, it's the best picture I could get. You weren't supposed to take pictures here. Okay? Uh, some days you can take a picture. Some days you can't. It depends on who's watching this particular... This is a monastery. That's what they call the nunneries. It's a place where nuns live. It's on the tops of these massive mountains somewhere. I can't remember the name of it. I'll tell you next week. But it's a monastery that we went in. We uh, got on a tour and we ended up having to go to these places. I'll be honest with you, I didn't even want to walk into this place. But I took a picture here for two reasons. I wasn't trying to spy on this man's religious devotion. But he was, he and his, he's elderly, but his more elderly mother were in, in, this, in this little, this would be the auditorium probably seats like 15 people. That's probably all people get to go to a place like that. But it's a Greek Orthodox church. And uh, over here is a little box. It's enclosed. And the top of the box is revealed to show the skull. This is, a, I think it's St. Stephen's Monastery. Not the Stephen, which is stone, but a monk that used to live there and help to build it. And that monk died and they took his skull and put it in the monastery and you can go in now they don't let you touch it but you could go in and kiss his skull which yeah. is in the salox that's disgusting isn't it <laughs> and these poor dear people are coming in there as solemnly as they possibly could crossing themselves and genuflecting and kissing this box and kissing this picture and the different things that this represents in hopes of somehow garnering favor with God we went outside and our tour guide, who is Orthodox, very connected with Orthodoxy, the tax rate in Greece is somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of your income. And of course, that includes the. I wonder what time it is. Am I over on time? It includes the taxes which are required for the state church. And oh man, we're over on time, folks. Yeah, we're going to have to we're going to have to pick it up next week. So let me finish this thought before we can. So we went outside, went into the breezeway, uh, and we were asking questions. And I asked some kind of, you know, softball questions to the tour guide. And I asked it for the sake of some people in our group that were just, oh, this is such a spiritual, wonderful place. I'm like, this is a creepy place. There's devils here, is what this is to me. But I asked a lady, she's very orthodox, uh, and she, she was talking about, one, how that 
they were asking about other religions. If you're not Orthodox, they basically, it's very, very difficult to be any other religion because you pay taxes to the state church, and then you can't get buried. Uh, you, can't, you can't get a burial and you, all these things that she was talking about. But I asked her the question, what is the connection between the saints, which are on the icons, which are they're all about painting icons, what's the connection between the saints and the icons, and of course the Greek mythological gods, because they just, everywhere you go, they talk about mythology, mythology, mythology. And she said, she said, well, she said, well, you know, each of the mythological gods has characteristics or personalities. And she talked about the god of light in Greek mythology and how that that Jesus is the god of light. Well, you know who Diana is. It's Mary. And, I mean, the lady that's part of orthodoxy, she said, you know, just so that the Greek culture, so that they can relate, you know, along with their mythology to their state religion, they have these things. I thought, well, that's very, very telling. It's very revealing. Now, the question is, how do you preach the gospel to people that believe that made-up gods are as valid because of their historical validity? One of the things I, did, I, I realized while we were there was that the people there held their, held their mythology in high, as high esteem as actual history. In other words, if, if the story, if the battle or the story of it, if this is the myth about it, we're not necessarily concerned with whether or not that myth is true. That's what we believe. And that is a core to who we are as a people. What we believe defines who we are. Of course, it's a philosophical kind of a nation. Now, we're going to continue this next week by talking about how do you reach your religious friends. And what we saw today is that, first of all, you have to understand what they're thinking and where they're coming from. I hope we got that much done today. But you have to understand where they're thinking or what they're thinking and where they're coming from. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, for the time this morning, and I ask that you would help us as we continue this next Sunday morning to be able to discern and to be able to understand how it is that we can reach people who are lost but who are religious. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll start our service on time. I apologize for going a little bit over.